Welcome everybody. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Not sure where you all are, uh, but it's the 61st Ariopa webinar. And today as guests, I have Marcus Liepert together with uh, Tobias Fenster. We work together at Cosmo on the uh, Alpaca solution. And today uh, they offered to uh, do this presentation on containerized CICD agents for either Azure DevOps or uh, GitHub. So I'm very pleased to have you over guys. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. And before I give uh, control over to you, let me do my normal round uh, on the housekeeping rules for everybody present. And uh, once more, welcome. I will be your moderator, me, Luc van Vught. Um, I will pick up questions. We agreed that that could be any time when it's relevant. And of course, there will always be some room at the end. Uh, your microphone is muted. Use the Q&A uh, question window, which I will be monitoring and picking up questions from. Um, and yes, don't hold back, even though maybe talking in a microphone might feel easier, but uh, you've time enough probably to type it. So uh, please do so. Recording will be, uh, I think I'll get it done this evening again. It's less busy, so uh, um, if you want to share it, uh, replay it for yourself, feel welcome to make use of our Ariopa webinars channel on uh, YouTube. Um, if you're not uh, yet uh, subscribe to our newsletter use this short url uh, you can also find it on our website uh, and get in the known and last week we <coughs> sent out a newsletter for the last changes unfortunately uh, uh, christoph uh, bioloas was ill uh, two weeks ago so we had to postpone that uh, session to the 3rd of april which is on the next list so next session on the 20th will be done by jan venendaal on the 6th of March, um, which was new on the newsletter too, is a functional session by Kristen Hosman. Um, and then followed two weeks later uh, by David Feldhoff's question, uh, sorry, question session on regular expressions. And yes, on the 3rd of April, Christoph's uh, session. We're open to, as always, anybody that wants to step in. Um, I realized that on this program, there are have been a lot of MVPs. That's not any prerequisites, please no. But of course, um, some might step in easier than the others, uh, but feel welcome to come up with suggestions for whatever topic, of course. Before I'm going to hand over to you guys, uh, Christoph and, uh, sorry, Marcus and uh, 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 Tobias, I want to thank our sponsor as always for enough and now allowing us to uh, make use of Go to webinar, which makes it much easier to uh, get registration set, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I think I'm going to uh, make you presenters, guys. So I'll need to select the right one here, and uh, now you can start sharing your screen. Yeah, that's seeable. Great. So you can see the screen. Yeah, and I can hear you too. Perfect. So then, um, welcome from our side as well. Um, we will introduce you in a second. Of course, the topic, as Luke already said, is containerized CI CD agents for Azure DevOps and GitHub. Um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, what is this anyway? So what are build agents? What are runners? Um, we will talk about why it makes sense to have self-hosted agents and runners and why it makes sense to have containerized agents and runners. Um, so basically, the first part is basically explaining why are we even doing this, and then we want to take a look at the actual implementation and real-life examples where both Marcus and I are sharing yeah, uh, scenarios that we use um, daily in our in our work for Cosmo and for 4PS, so that you can see um, how this actually applies to a real-life business central development organization. But as I said, first we want to introduce ourselves. My name is Tobias Svensser. I'm a managing partner at 4PS in Germany. I'm also on the community side, a Microsoft Regional Director and dual MVP for Azure and for business applications, and since recently a Docker captain. If you like what you're seeing today and you're not in touch with me yet, um, you can find my handles on Twitter and on LinkedIn, on Mastodon, um, GitHub, and my blog URL. So um, I think, or I hope that this gives enough uh, opportunities for you to get in touch with me. I'm always happy to have a discussion, being it on Business Central, other tech topics, whatever, and I'm always happy to hearing from the community. 
So please feel absolutely free to get in touch um, through any of those channels if you have any kind of discussion that you want to have with me. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, hello also from my side. My name is Markus Lippert. I'm a Devils Engineer at Cosmo Consult. I'm also the technical lead for Cosmo Alpaca. And if you, if you want to get in touch with me, um, you can also find my social handles here on the bottom. Um, also, always happy to talk about any technical topics with you. Great. So let's take a look um, at the actual topics. What are build agents? What are runners? Um, first of all, if you want to do CI CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment, then you need somewhere where your actual code, your pipelines is running. I guess that by now everyone is aware of the basic idea, but um, in general speaking, CI CD takes care of taking your source code, bringing it together into a package, and then um, moving it to a customer environment, to app source, to whatever um, target environment you have. And what a pipeline does in that scenario is that it typically downloads your code, your source code in, in our community. Most likely that's AL code, but that could also be C sharp, that could be Python, that could be PHP, whatever you need. Um, it would compile the app, hopefully run some automated testing, maybe do a test deployment, and then release the artifacts to some kind of storage. So basically, it's it's a collection of code that needs to run that compromises or uh, comprises your CI CD overall setup. And to be able to do that, of course, something needs to run that code, something needs to run that pipeline. And that is the place where the build agents or the runners come in. Um, for the naming convention or terminology that we want to talk about today, when we're talking about Azure DevOps build agents and GitHub runners, that's basically the same thing. That's a piece of software that runs um, the pipeline. And if we're talking about Azure pipelines or GitHub Actions, sometimes even workflows, that's also talking about the pipelines in general. I think both of us are coming from an Azure DevOps back end, uh, background, so we might lean towards the uh, Azure DevOps words, but um, we also will share how it works on GitHub. And if you are more focused on the GitHub side of things, then Runners and Actions is basically uh, the terminology that you will find. So what typically happens is that something in your repo triggers a pipeline run that could be a push by a developer, that could be a pull request, that could be um, a tag that is created, that could be um, uh, something timed. So basically every night at a specific time you're running your pipeline or whatever. And then an agent or a runner needs to pick that up and run it with the right capabilities. So basically what we want to do with build agents and runners is that we get a trigger, we collect um, the things that are listed here, and then we can run the actual code. The agents that run the pipeline should include all the tools, the frameworks, the frameworks, the SDKs. So again, in our case, we probably um, always need an AL compiler to compile our AL code, but it could also be something that even has um, NAV or Business Central installed to do the deployment. Um, it could have things like Docker. It could have a C-sharp framework if you need to do some compilation there as well. So yeah, you basically need the full setup. Um, if we're looking at the standard offerings by Azure DevOps and GitHub, then they also provide standard agents. So you can just use whatever Microsoft is providing either through the Azure DevOps site or the GitHub site to just run your build agents but you can also run them self-hosted. And we will go into a discussion in a second why that makes sense. What we won't discuss today is the pipelines, the workflows, the actions themselves. So how you set up your pipeline, how um, you're collecting the source code, running your compilation and so on, that is a different topic. And I know there have been multiple sessions on that on the Ariopa webinars um, already. You find a lot of content there um, on the internet, uh, either by um, people who are having offerings like ALGO by Microsoft, um, ALOps by Valdo, uh, Cosmo Alpaca by Cosmo, or um, people in the community who are providing it. So we really feel that um, this is pretty well covered already and we'll mainly talk about our core topic today. So I hope that this gives you a bit of a background um, what we want to talk about in general, but I also want to share why we want to look into self-hosted agents or self-hosted runners. Well, first of all, it gives you full control over the installed tools. So basically, you can make the decision what kind of SDK, what kind of compiler, what kind of version, what kind of uh, third-party tools you want to have installed in your agents, in your runners. 
and you can also um, fully control the resources and the performance. Of course, as always, the more resources you um, make available, the higher the cost, but also the faster the build. So this is something that you can fully control if you have self-hosted agents. You can also control how many things are running in parallel. So for example, if you want to build your app source solution um, on the current release, on the next major, on the next minor, and maybe even on older releases for your on-prem customers, then you could do all of this um, in parallel, but then of course you need to have a bigger machine. Uh, so that's the kind of setup, setup that you can uh, fully control and decide on your own if you have self-hosted agents. And then if we talk about um, self-hosted agents, a big benefit is also caching. So um, if you, for example, consider that you need to download your sources, you need to download artifacts from Microsoft to get the source code from them or the apps or dependencies or whatever, um, that's a big thing that always needs to happen in every pipeline. And if you're using the same agent over and over again, then you know that this is already in place. You can have a caching mechanism. If you're creating Docker images, caching is a yeah, highly relevant topic there as well. So you have some benefits there. We also are sharing here the pricing, both for Azure DevOps and for GitHub. You can see here that there is specific pricing for parallel jobs, for self-hosted jobs on, on Azure DevOps, but it also comes with um, a couple of things for free. And then if you look into GitHub with the GitHub Actions, there's also some parts that are free and some parts that cost. So we don't wanna go into the details of the pricing discussion here or even suggest to use one or the other because this is really a it depends um, decision where um, depending on how many Visual Studio subscriptions you maybe have depending on how many builds you want to do. Do you want to run in parallel or not? And so on. Um, it really, yeah, it ca you can come to different outcomes if one or the other is cheaper or more expensive. So the other question, um, now that we've discussed why self-hosted is important for us, is why you should do it uh, in a containerized environment. And the answer for that is that if you're running containerized, then you know that you always get a clean environment when you spin up a new container. Um, as you can imagine, if you do this on, an, uh, on a VM or even on, on bare metal hardware, then you always have the situation that the first pipeline does something, it might have um, a side effect on your host machine, and now the second pipeline is coming along, the third, the fourth, the fifth, um, the hundreds, the thousands, whatever, and you will probably get into a situation where your environment is no longer clean. The agent doesn't work anymore for whatever reason, or you get different um, results for basically the same build, but on different environments. And that is something that you, of course, always um, absolutely want to um, avoid. If you have it containerized, then you also have almost no need to um, set up and maintain the agents because it's fully contained in the container. All you need to do is just create a new container and then the setup and the maintenance automatically works for you. We will share in a second how that works in detail, but that's also the idea to save on the setup and maintenance tasks. You also get no configuration drift. Um, configuration drift is the thing when someone logs into environment A, makes a change in the configuration or installs a new fix, or because it was installed later, it gets a later version of the AL compiler than the other environment and so on. And if that happens, you might have uh, the situation where the same build that is running on different environments uh, gets different results. And again, that is obviously something that you don't want. Also, if you're using containers, um, for example, BC Container Helper, or directly to spin up BC containers and do your builds to do your automated tests or something like this, then it's also a natural fit because then you have to install the container um, tooling, most likely Docker anyways, and then you can use it for the agents as well. We can do on-demand scaling and parallelization. So that means if I figure out that now I need four agents, I can easily just um, scale from one container to four containers and allow parallel run. And when I'm done, I can easily scale back. But again, this is something that we will show you in a second. For stability, um, if you have a broken agent, then that can be a real problem because suddenly your pipelines will fail, people will get nervous, they maybe can't push out that important hotfix to a customer or whatever. And um, if you have to set up a whole VM or even just the agents, that can be quite a bit of work um, and can yeah, create quite some pressure on your DevOps team or on the, the um, 
professionals who are handling this. And if you have it containerized, then this is very easy because creating a new one is yeah, something that you can do with a couple of clicks. Again, as we will show um, in a second, so this really makes it easy um, to, to set up new uh, agents in, in the case of some disaster or some, some breakage that happens. It works by setting up a Docker file and then having a resulting image. And this could be done on your own VM or on bare metal. So really, when you think about containerization, you can do this in the cloud, as both Marcus and I will be showing. But this could also happen on directly on bare metal, or it could happen in your own VMs that you have running in your own data center or whatever. So basically, um, this doesn't depend on running in the cloud or running with some kind of infrastructure provider, but it really would work everywhere. It's just a different yeah, deployment mechanism that you would use uh, for the different scenarios. What we will cover today for containerization is uh, two variations. We're doing both on-demand and pre-created. The idea here is that on-demand on um, would mean that you would create a new build agent or a new runner container whenever the pipeline runs. So basically, the first step of that pipeline run would be to create a new agent, and then it would pick up the actual pipeline. What that means is that you get a truly clean environment, always new um, for each and every run. So you definitely don't have any configuration drift, any leftover things from the last run um, at all. And it allows you to be dynamically scalable, because whenever a new pipeline is started, a new container starts. So if, let's say, 10 pipelines start at the, at the same time, then you have 10 containers in parallel. What it requires, and that's the, the one big drawback here, is that you need to have a backend service that is able to create those containers on demand. If we're talking about pre-created environments, then this would be the idea that you create a host VM or bare metal hardware with a build agent or runner container created in advance. So you have the benefit of having it in containerization. You have the benefit of having it under your full control, but you need to pre-create it. That means that if you need a clean environment, you would have to manually restart it or recreate it. And otherwise, the same instance would be reused so um, to a degree, you might see some clutter in that container, but then it would be easy to fix by just removing and creating it again. And it is manually scalable. That means that um, when a new pipeline comes in and is blocked, you could create a new container uh, manually, and that would um, then, of course, be picked up by the pipeline, and you get some scalability and, and parallelization that way. <laughs> And as a mix, and that is actually what I will be presenting, you could have um, the on-demand start of a VM, which already has pre-created environments. So that way, you're not creating new containers all the time, but you also don't have to have a virtual machine that is running all the time. So it kind of helps to combine some of the benefits of both worlds. What the best approach is here is, unfortunately, again, an it depends decision. So if you already have a possible backend in place, um, or you can create and maintain that one, then on-demand is a great solution. If you don't have that, then probably you have to lean towards pre-created. Um, also, the question is, how cost-sensitive are you? Do you mind whether a VM is running all the time, or is it better if you can restart it? Is it running in your data center anyway, so you basically don't care? No, there, there's a lot of um, variables and decision points here. And actually, whether you do it on demand or pre-created has no connection, whether you're running on Azure DevOps or you're running on GitHub. Both approaches are possible in both platforms. Um, what we will be showing is how on demand works in connection with Azure DevOps. And we will show how pre-created works with connection to GitHub. But that is basically random, because we had those scenarios already pre-created. And we wanted to show you something from our real life. But you could um, implement both approaches in both platforms. So much for the theory. Now I'll hand it over to Marcus for um, explaining the implementation on Azure DevOps. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. So we will start with the implementation of, of the Azure DevOps build agent containers. We will first have a look at uh, we will first have a look at how the image are built, <clears throat> and in the second step, then have a look at how the how the um, how the images then run. 
So for, <clears throat> so for the first step for building the image, we need to download the build agent binaries first. Then we need to then we need to add our dependencies. So if you want to, for example, build your AL apps, then you would would want um, something like the VC container helper. If you would like to use the agent uh, to run to run your pipelines for your .NET, app, .NET applications, then you then you might want to to add the .NET SDK here. So that that just depends on your need. And and um, we also need, need to add some startup script there that is then um, that then does the registration of the agent um, on the container startup. Um, we will also have a look at that. So uh, I already prepared two Docker files, one for Business Central and one for .NET, .NET applications, and let's have a look at them. So that is the one for Business Central. We see the base image here is the .NET framework, and that, that's that's why the um, and that is why the we, um, that is because the VC container helper depends on it that way, <laughs> and we also we also um, have some parameters here for one the VC container helper version, and um, also the organization URL and the PAT, and those parameters are basically used here to download the agent binaries. So we use the Azure DevOps APIs to get the binaries and also use the PAT to do the authentication against that API. And here we download the, the archive basically and then expand it. So that's the way how, how the agent is set up. And as a second step, we then just need to install our dependencies. So, so we, 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 use, we use Shoko in, in, in that case here, and we install the Docker CLI so that the VC container help, helper is able to create VC containers and um, also the, um, the PowerShell module for VC container, of course, and a little bit more here. And so just some other dependencies we also want to have available within our pipelines. And at the end, we also add our startup script, um, but we will have a look at that later on. Let's first have a look at um, the second Docker file. So that's the one for the .NET applications. So this Docker file looks very similar. We just time the uh, we just time depend on the server core image, so not the framework. Um, we again. We again have the, the organization URL and the PAT, which are passed, and we again um, download the agent binaries here. So that that is just the same like we like we saw before, um, but this time we have some different dependencies. So we're not just having the Docker CLI here, but we also have the .NET Core SDK here because we want to compile and publish our .NET applications um, within pipelines that are running on that agent, and we also have some some different PowerShell modules here installed. And again, we have the startup script here at the end. Um, so yeah, we'll have a look at that in a minute. So that would be the way how you can create um, the container image. Um, with, with those whole two Docker files, you can basically then run Docker build, uh, give the image a name, um, specify the Docker file you, you want to use. So in this case, it would be the PC um, Docker file. We can also specify the Windows version here and the organization URL again, and the PAT token. So with that, you have the, the container image available. Um, so we now can have a look at how we can run that container image um, 41. We also need to pass our organization and the PAT here as environment variables. So that is used that the agent can, in a second step, then be configured and, and be started. The agent then registers itself at the organization and runs the jobs. And at the end, if we, if we stop our container again, the agent then would, would unregister itself um, and, and remove itself from the agent pool, basically. So that is all happening within the startup script I just mentioned. So we can also have a look at how that looks in code, basically. <clears throat> so we can see that we pass our organization URL here, also the, um, the PRT as a, as a file or also as an environment variable. And we can specify some more, like the working directory and others. Um, but the interesting part is here at the bottom where the configuration happens. So here we, we just we, uh, we just calling the configuration script that also comes with the um, with the build agent binaries. So we give the agent a name here, and um, we also specify the organization URL that 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 we pass to the container. Um, we specify the PAT. And the agent pool and the working directory, and with that, the agent is basically configured. 
We also have some um, BC specifics in here, but I will just ignore that for now. Um, interesting again is that we then um, that we then are able to to start our agent, and um, so it is ready to to retrieve the jobs and run the jobs. Also interesting here the button, the finally part. Um, so that part would be executed um, when the container is stopped or removed. So in that case, we want to remove our agent from the agent pool again. And there we are also just calling the configuration script to, um, to remove the agent this time. Yeah, so, so with that, you basically have the, the base container in place. And so you can easily start and stop agents. You can easily replace agents. So that already gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, but in a second step, we now want to have a look at the on-demand agents um, to be as just, just mentioned. So again, the idea for the on-demand agents is that we want a new and clean build agent container for every pipeline we run. Um, so we, we don't we don't just have the build agents available all the time, but we want, want to have them available only when we are, when they are needed, basically. So um, let's have a look at how this is done. So we for one have the organization here, the DevOps organization, and you have some kind of container infrastructure. So, so that could just be a, a simple VM with Docker installed, or maybe also a cluster if you want to go a little bit more advanced. Um, and what we need here is some kind of container API. So some API that is able to, to start and stop and remove containers and doing just uh, basic container handling, basically. Then we can have, have a look at our pipeline within our organization. So the, 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 the real special thing here is that, that we are using serverless jobs um, to, to, to issue requests against our container API. So the serverless jobs can, uh, can run without any agents available, like the name also implies. And we use it to, to just tell the container API that we want to, that we want to have a, a build agent available. So we request the build agent, the container API then starts the build agent container and the build agent container runs the startup script we, we just looked at and within that, um, that script, the agent registers itself at the organization. So we are now ready to run our jobs. So the next step in our pipeline would be just a, a, normal, a normal agent job basically. So you can do just anything in there, like compiling your AL apps, um, create DC containers, or, or compile your .NET applications. So anything you want to do. <clears throat> so that job is then just retrieved from the build agent and it's executed. And um, yeah, at the end, we again just do the same like in the beginning. We again would have a serverless job that um, again re um, issues a request to the container API, but to this time remove the build agent. So that would be the way how you can work with on-demand agents. You can see that at the beginning of our pipelines, we just start our, our build agent container and at the end, we remove it again. And um, this brings quite some benefit, but I will also want to show you that in a real life example first um, before talking about the benefits. So we also use the on-demand agents a lot, a lot within Cosmo Attacker. Um, the reason for that is that we already have a lot of container infrastructure for the business central containers and also for the Alpaca APIs. And um, so for, for us, it was just a natural fit to also run the, the DevOps agents as containers as well. And we also have around 600 pipeline runs a day. Um, so we wouldn't want to manually like create agent containers, remove them and replace them if, if there are some, some, some errors or some problems with them. Um, so that was the reason why we settled on the on the on-demand agents. So to, we wanted just to make sure that they are always clean, that they always behave behave the same, um, and that we are sure that our pipelines um, always run. Uh, and another big benefit here is, of course, for us that that um, the agent containers would all would only consume resources um, if the pipelines are run. So that would really make make a bigger impact at scale if you if you have have the resources available. So if you have no no agent containers that are running in idle all the time, and have like six hundred of them, so that would really um, yeah cause a lot of resources. Okay, and also the, the last benefit, of course, um, you cannot only scale the, the number of agents dynamically. So you normally would have one agent per pipeline in this case, um, but um, you, you not only scale the containers, but you can also scale the underlying cloud, cloud infrastructure. So imagine um, during the day, maybe you have, you have a lot of pipelines running. You might want to have five VMs with, with five build containers each. 
um, but maybe during the night you have you have a lot, a lot less pipelines and maybe just some 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 scheduled pipelines or something like that. And um, so you, maybe during the night just one VM with like five build agent containers is enough. So you can you can just uh, you can just scale the number of agents down during the night and scale them up um, during the day again um, to just save some some resources and save some infrastructure costs. Yep, I will also show you that in a quick demo. So the on-demand agents we um, we just talked about. I prepared a little project here. Um, also got a pipe, pipeline in here. And then let me just open the protainer here again. So that's my pipeline. I'm just going to start that one. And here within the pipeline, you can see the, the, the two special jobs basically. So for one, the start agent container and the stop agent container. So that are our, our serverless jobs that are running without any agent available. And in there, we are basically requesting and again at the end, removing the build agent container. So here, if you have a look into that, um, we can see we call our container API here. So in our case, there are that, that some, some uh, Alpaca APIs that we are calling. Um, in this case, we are just um, setting some environment variables, some parameters we want to have. And you can see we also set the, um, the build agent image we want to use. So that is now starting a, a build agent container in the background and um, takes a few seconds. You can see that it took like nine seconds or something like that. And now the, the build job is already running on, the, on that agent. And we can um, have a look at the, at the container infrastructure in the meantime. So I'm now switching to Portainer. Portainer is just a scale of it. Yeah. Portainer is just a graphical interface for managing containers. Um, and we can have a look at here um, at the running containers. So if I look just at the last build agent this has, that has been created, um, I can also have a look at the logs. And you can see that the agent basically, basically did just that, what, is, what, what was written or what was scripted into the setup script. So the configuration is happening here. Then the agent connects to the server. And then it, it retrieves the jobs, basically. And then it runs the build PC job. So that's just the same like um, in the pipeline here. Also, we can have a look at the environment variables of the build agent or that has been passed to the build agent. Um, so you see the agent is named 3 minus 29. And we assign it to the, to the agent pool that is named the same like the project. We passed our PAT token and we got the organization URL in here and also some, some more variables. And if you now have a look on the other side, so um, at the agent pools in here, you can also see that the agent that registers is exactly that one. So that's also called 3 minus 29. So that's the one we just looked at. So the pipeline would now just run and at the, at the end do again what is, um, what, is what we also did um, at the beginning. So it would, it would then request the Container API to this time remove the agent container again, and and yeah, basically uh, clean up afterward. Um, also to note, maybe the container API is is is, is, is currently uh, in, internally used in, in Cosmo Alpaca, um, but basically if you want to build that for yourself, you basically just need an endpoint to create containers, another one to remove to remove them. So it's not that that hard basically to do. And if you need any help then please just get in contact. Okay, so much for the demo. Okay, then um, Tobias can continue with the GitHub. Thanks, Marcus. So um, yeah, as Marcus said, um, we were using Azure DevOps and the on-demand scenario. I want to basically show you the other base technology widely used, which is GitHub, and um, how we can do something with a pre-created environment. But first of all, same as Marcus, I want to show you how the image is built. What we're doing is basically more or less the same. Um, for a reason I don't remember anymore, um, I used a different um, 
uh, different order. So um, as Marcus showed, he first did the download and the expand and then the dependencies. Um, what we're seeing here is first the download, the dependencies, and then um, the download and expand of the runner, but that actually doesn't matter, could have been done in the, in the other way around. So if we take a look at this Docker file, what does it look like? Um, you will find a lot of similarities. Again, we're starting the build here on server core because I'm not building Business Central in this case. I'm doing a C-sharp build. Then I'm downloading Chocolati here for the installation of my dependencies. We have the Docker CLI because we want to build a Docker image. We have Git because we want to check out the sources. And we have JQ because we want to do some string parsing in here. And then we're downloading um, the current runner from GitHub, as you can see here, with a configurable version. We're expanding it so that we have, um, we have it in place. We remove the zip file that we downloaded because now we have expanded it so we don't need it anymore. And then we have a startup script which is called command.ps1 in this scenario. So this is again very, very similar. What we can do to run an actual build, you can see here, this would be a Docker build. We um, might want to run this for different Windows versions so it might make sense to have isolation Hyper-V in here. Then we have as a build argument, the Windows base version, which in this case is 2022. And we have the version of the GitHub runner um, 296 in this scenario, we call it my runner and then that's it. So if you run this, you have your own GitHub runner image. And now of course we need to run it. What happens during the run is that um, we need to have parameters for the GitHub organization or the repo, the name of the runner, and again, a personal access token, same as in Azure DevOps for the authentication. Um, what is different in my approach is that I'm first trying to remove an existing runner, then configure a new one and start it and check if that has worked. And the reason for that is, as we will also see in a minute, that um, in the end, I'm not cleaning up carefully like uh, Marcus has shown, but instead, um, because this might just run into a timeout at, at three at night, I'm just stopping my VM. So someone basically just um, removes the plug and then I don't have time anymore for a clean um, disconnect. So then um, I'm just checking whether there is some leftover from the last run and um, clean it up on, on startup of the next one. Not 100% clean as uh, Marcus shown, but also, yeah, works quite well. So let's take a look at the startup script. As I said, we hand in the repository or organization and we hand in the personal access token that we want to use. Then we first try to remove, then we try to configure a new one, and then we run as a, a startup script, the run command that comes with the agent. Maybe interesting to note are the lines eight and nine above here, where you can see that there is a different token that you need to um, get for removing and for re registering. That took me a bit to figure out. Um, and that's why as a token here, the removal token is used for, of course, removing. And here the registration token is used for registering. And then I'm basically um, checking whether the runner is already there. If the runner listener process is running, which is, yeah, basically the runner process. Um, I'm retrying this for three times, waiting 10 seconds. So as you can see here, this is basically waiting for half a minute. And if it reaches the maximum, then it just stops. Otherwise, um, it would just run. So again, a very easy process to set it up, but because it's fully containerized, we know that the dependencies are in place. We know that it will always behave the same and have the same structure. So this is actually pretty yeah, fail safe, I would say. Um, so what am I using as a backend, as an infrastructure? I am using a VM, again, with Portainer, the uh, GUI container management tool that Marcus has just shown you, and also traffic as a reverse proxy. And that comes pre-installed by using a quick start template. You can find this by going to the Azure quick start template list and just searching for Portainer, because that's the only one that exists there. Um, and then we will use either a custom Docker Compose stack for the deployment, or um, a custom app template. But yeah, we will take a look at both again. So to quickly check how that works, first of all, let me search for the Azure Quick Start templates. Go here. And then let's sort, search for container. Oh. And there we have exactly one. 
And then I would advise you to not directly click deploy to Azure, but first browse code. And then if you scroll down here, you get a similar one, but that does something slightly different. And once it has started, you get an easy way how you can set up your subscription, your resource group, and so on. So basically the metadata, and then you can set up um, the size of the, uh, the, sorry, the version for Windows and the size that you want to use for your runner, a username, a password, an SSH key to uh, connect via SSH, and the size of the data disk. And if you then just run review and create, then you will get um, the VM same as I'm using, and you can connect using the browser to Portainer and, and set it up um, like you need it. So that should give you um, a very easy starting point. Um, yeah, to give you again a, an overview of how the things then work, um, we are using a pre-created runner. So the idea is that the runner is of course created in advance. We have our GitHub organization or project and we have the VM infrastructure. In this case, we don't have a container API, so I'm not using the um, Alpaca backend for this one, but instead we have a different flow. First of all, when the action starts, you have as an initial step a request for the backend to start. So that VM that you can create through that quick start template that I just showed you would be asked to just start if it's not already running. Um, so that's just a call to the Azure API. And then we know that our VM is starting and because of the way how the containers are set up, our action, um, our runner containers are also running. Because yeah, the host VM is starting and that means that the runner containers are also automatically starting. It registers itself with the GitHub organization as we've seen in the startup script and then the actual runner steps. So the pipeline itself can run the steps on the runner container. So it would just run the jobs here. And as I already mentioned, I don't have a cleanup step in that scenario, but instead, instead for example, at night or at the weekend, you could automatically stop the VM because you might not have any, any builds that are scheduled or that are running. So you can save some resources and with that also yeah, save some money. As a real life example, I want to show you um, the job that I'm running to creating a traffic image. As I said, that's the reverse proxy, but yeah, it actually doesn't matter. The, the story basically is that we're creating a container image. Um, of course, container images are very much benefiting from existing layers. So if we would use a cloud runner in this scenario, we would have a significantly worse performance. That's why self-hosted makes sense. And I'm only very occasionally running that pipeline because only once an upstream release of portain, uh, sorry, of traffic is happening, which is every few weeks, I would say. Sometimes it's even only um, a couple of months when a new release is happening. So predefined is completely fine for me. I don't need it um, created on demand all the time. And the nightly shutdown also is enough for me for cost saving because let's say I'm running this um, at two in the afternoon, and then at three at night, the VM is stopping. And then for the next couple of weeks, um, I'm not using that VM anymore. So there's really very only limited cost that occurs here. Okay, so let's take a look um, at what we're actually doing. I have shown you already how it works for the VM. Now let's take a look into Portainer, which is already here. So this is now um, basically the new environment that we have created um, using that quick start template. And as you can see here, we already have a couple of containers and uh, stacks on here. And the first method how we can run our GitHub runners is by using a stack. And if we take a look at the editor, you can find here, um, if you're familiar with Docker Compose, that's the same syntax here. Um, so you can see that we are just defining what is called a service. And then in this case, this is the one I want to look at. Um, I'm using the image for the GitHub runner. I'm saying it always starts to make sure that when the VM starts, also the container is starting. I hand in the GitHub repository, which is traffic for Windows. I hand in the personal access token. I give it a name and um, that's basically it. So if we take a look at that repository, and I need to type it incorrectly, then you can see here in the action section, this is where the pipelines are running. If we um, if we would run that, then we can see where it, where it starts. 
if I take a look at the actual run, then you can see that we're first starting the VM. So this is basically here doing a login to Azure, and then it's doing an AC VM start, which is starting um, the, the Azure VM. So this is the step that makes sure that my VM is running. If it already is running because I'm doing a repeated run for whatever reason, then this will just also work. Um, because the Azure API just accepts that if you start a running VM, then it will just yeah continue to run. And this is the actual build step. As you can see here, this is doing whatever my pipeline wants. This could also be business central code, code of course, by using something like ALGO or your own pipelines. Um, but in this case, we're building a Docker image and pushing it and, and so on. So that is basically just the, the pipeline code itself. Um, now, what I also wanted to show you is how it in the end stops. So if we go back here, this is the Azure portal for this particular virtual machine. As I said, I want it to stop at night. And there is a specific section here that is called auto shutdown. And you can see here that at 3 a.m. in the Berlin time zone, this is stopping. You can also send a notification. So then you would get an email. And if for whatever reason um, you are awake at 2.30 at night, that notification happens uh, half an hour before, it's, before it happens, then you could go in here and disable the, the auto shutdown if you really need it. But yeah, I'm typically not awake at that, at that time. So I don't want to get that notification. Um, so this is the, the general setup. What I also want to mention is that you not only have the way to use this stack, because that might be, yeah, it's, it's not very complicated, but still it's, it's slightly cryptic. So um, there's also another opportunity for you or another option to create such a runner. And that is by using um, the app templates. The standard templates don't have a runner image, but what you can do is you can go to the settings here and select instead of the Portainer standard templates, my repository for templates. Save this one. Now, if we go back into the app templates and search for runner again, you can see that there is now a GitHub runner template. If I select this, I need to give it a name. Tell it which repository we want to use and in a personal access token. Of course, this is not a correct uh, access token, which is why it would fail. But I also don't want to show you my personal access token because I would have to revoke it afterwards. Um, we give it a name and then I can just say deploy the stack. And after a couple of seconds, it should come back with a success manage. Now you can see the message. Now you can see here that I have a my new runner stack. That one has created such a runner container using the GitHub runner image. And if we take a look at the log for that one, it of course it gets a bad credentials error message because ABC123 is not a valid access token. But if it was a valid access token, then it would work. And what it would look like, I can also show you through the other one. <coughs> Sorry. So um, again, it first of all, you can see I'm doing this repeatedly. It's removing the runner. It's connecting it, it, um, it is uh, registering a new runner, and then it's waiting for, um, for jobs to come in. So basically, again, the same structure that we've seen in the script. Okay, let me check my notes. I think that is what I wanted to show you for the GitHub scenario. Um, yeah, and we just did the demo. So with that, I think we have all the content that we wanted to show you, and I'll hand it back to Marcus for a wrap up of, of, of what we've seen. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so we, we just learned that for the ICD, we need some, some kind of agent or runners to run our pipelines. And we also may want to use self-hosted agents or runners because we have, we have more control with them. We can, we can easily, um, uh, yeah, we, we can we can we can also save on some costs and um, get a little bit more performance. Um, you might also want to use uh, want to containerize your agents or runners because the setup, the maintenance, and the parallelization is a lot more simple with that. So you can you can easily just create and re recreate agents if they, if they if they have a problems from time to time. And um, so that's just a, a lot quicker than manually setting everything up and configuring everything. 
Also with containerized agents and runners, you get an always clean environment and the, an environment that behaves always the same. So that, that is really perfect if you need to make sure that your pipeline is always behaving the same. And yeah, we also had a look at the pre-created and the on-demand agents and runners. And we learned that the pre-created ones are created once and, 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 and are reused then, um, but they can be easily replaced. And you can also manually scale them. So you can you can just like run five or four, um, five or six agents for your um, for your organization. So you can run multiple pipelines in parallel. And if you want to get a little bit more flexible, then you can use the on-demand agents to do that um, automatically. So the idea of the on-demand agents is, is that we start a new agent container for each pipeline we want to run, and to auto also automatically delete them afterwards. Um, and what you also can do with that is dynamically scale the infrastructure and also the number of containers. Um, but, but again, for that, you, you need some kind of container API to do that. Also, of, co of course, a, a mix is possible. So like Tobias just showed, you can also um, create a VM with some pre-created environments, so some pre-created agent containers um, on it, and then um, start that VM on demand um, with, a, with an additional step in, in your pipelines. Okay, with that, we are already at the end. Um, we also prepared some links for you. So the first two here are the, the container images for the build agent and for the, for the runner. Um, the third one is the quick start template that we have also showed for creating a Windows VM with Docker, Portainer, and Traffic installed. And the fourth one are the Portainer templates to, to quickly create a GitHub runner via the graphical interface of Portainer. Okay, with that, thank you a lot for listening, and um, we are now happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, thank yes, you. thanks a lot. My turn as well. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, there has been no question put into the question window, but I noted a, a couple of them down for myself. Um, uh, uh, the mixed one, I understand clearly that that gives the advantage of having a uh, pre-configured uh, uh, well, image or a VM, whatever. Um, but um, what is your experience with if you um, um, for Azure DevOps? That's my my context at the moment still. If you have a on-the-fly agent being created, um, if the, your workspace where it uh, downloads all the source files that it's going to pick up AL source files to to go and build a new extension or the extension a new. Um, how much time is that overhead? Because often, I, uh, with my experience, having just reused uh, agents, they speed up very quickly because of the fact that they find out, okay, source has not changed a lot. We only download the Delta part. Is is just for my understanding, how much is that overhead with creating on the fly a new, a new uh, runner, or in this case, agents like you showed? I mean, if you if you just do this, um, let's say stupidly, then you get the same result as if you're using um, cloud agents by Microsoft in Azure DevOps or in GitHub, yeah. which is definitely a couple of minutes to your runtime, maybe even more. Um, what we are doing in Cosmo Alpaca is that we are creating an agent all the time, but we still have um, a caching um, directory where things like the artifacts are already pre-cached, um, so that when you're running the agents, it's actually yeah a clean agent, but it's reusing some of the things that we put in place as caching. And that means that, as you've seen, um, looking at Marcus' um, repository or uh, example, it starts up very quickly, although it is a new agent because we added some caching in between. But if you just use it as it comes out of the box, then you would get um, very slow builds. I, I would say that it adds at least a couple of minutes um, if you're creating containerized builds, so using a business central container for your builds, then that would add at least 15 minutes overhead. So um, in that scenario, you would definitely get get very slow builds. Yeah. Okay. Clear. So that that's my clear understanding. For um, if 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 my or how do you do the caching? Just as uh, maybe a tip of the the veil. Uh, I mean each new build agent potentially has another uh, name of course so is the caching then what what way is that done and i'm curious about that 
the, so the caching is basically um, happening on the host machine and we're connecting the cache to the container. You can share um, things like the Docker engine or um, host folders with the container. And by doing that, we can see that um, this happens fast. So yes, exactly as uh, we can see here, we have um, the DC artifacts cache, for example, which is an example of, of things that go a lot faster if you have that in place. And this is just mounted from the host into the container. So when the next container starts, it will find the same pre-created cache for the DC artifacts and can just reuse them. Oh, okay. Okay, clear. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, no other questions have come up. I think that was the most important one. I think, uh, well, very nice. Uh, gives me a, a, a good impression of, of those possibilities. And I think might be that many of us thought about this, uh, how we're going to do it, but this would be a great heads up to anybody wanting to uh, uh, get into this one. And thank you also for the uh, the templates and the other examples you're sharing. Um, nobody else having put in a question on the questions window. So for now, let me pick up as presenter here to show my screen to thank you all for being here. Um, and of course, the two of you, Marcus and Tobias, thank you very much for being here and sharing this information with all together, us all together. So, uh, well, looking forward to uh, any next things coming up, of course. Um, I think we close down for today. So, guys, thank you very much. And everybody present, uh, thank you for being here. And, uh, well, in a way, spread the word around. Thanks for having us. And, of course, um, as we already mentioned, if you want to get in touch later with any questions, feel free to do so. Yes, thanks. <clears throat> Bye for now.